In this video, I'm going to be talking about ROS2 fundamentals. First, what is ROS? Well, it stands for the Robot Operating System. It's a system for operating robots. It's not a traditional operating system like Windows or Linux. It really sits between the traditional operating system and your robotics applications. It's a mature middleware that has been around for over a decade. It was originally built by a company called Willow Garage and is now maintained by Open Robotics. ROS2 is the commercialized evolution of ROS, specifically built for commercial and industrial robotics, and it's used worldwide today. It's a bit complex with a steep learning curve, and in this video series, I hope to demystify ROS. So let's cover some ROS concepts. Composability and distributed systems, the PubSub model, and some ROS2 tools. Composability means that your solution is built up of numerous reusable parts. These parts can come from third parties or written by yourself. They are just can be distributed as binary script or source that you include in your workspace. In ROS, these reusable components are called nodes. I like to say configuration defines the robot because you actually are building configuration files called launch files, which launch these composable nodes and configures them so that they can talk to each other. Nodes can start and shut down as needed. For example, if you have a running robot and you want to control it with a console, you can go ahead and start up your console, connect to that robot, submit joystick messages and receive video output, but also shut it down and the robot will know no difference. ROS is also a distributed system. This means that your robot solution can be built up of multiple networked CPUs. For example, a Jetson Nano and Raspberry Pi, uh, a Windows board, all working together, and each running ROS separately with messages streaming between them. You can also have microcontrollers in your solution, and these can communicate over serial protocols, radio protocols, using micro ROS2, which is a separate project but related. The default middleware for ROS is built on the Data Distribution Service, or DDS protocol, which is an industry standard PubSub protocol. So let's talk a little bit about how this will work. Say we have a ROS node that implements inertial measurement. This hardware has some concept of its orientation, and it will provide acceleration data linearly as well as rotationally. In order to get the data off the hardware, I have to implement code that starts up, opens up that piece of hardware and says, okay, what is your state? And read it as it's generating data. In ROS, the ROS launch file, when it starts up this node, can say, hey, I want you to talk to ID 58. Okay, so you have an executable, which loads, is given some configuration, and on startup says, hey, ROS, I'm here. Hey, hardware, I want to talk to you. So we'll be building an IMU node, which will communicate with this hardware. Various different ROS packages are dependent on IMU, and they expect to be able to read it in a standardized format. In this case, there is a standard message package called sensor message IMU, which includes orientation, angular acceleration, and linear acceleration. There is a specification for the units of these items, so um, we'll refer to those when we go build this node. In order for someone else to hear these messages, it needs to subscribe on a specific topic. And by convention, it is slash IMU slash IMU raw. Now this is unfiltered data that's coming off the IMU. There are other topics and uh, other data streams on a single IMU that you can have, um, That's ha but this is the uh, a, one of the standardized ones. As the node is generating data off from the hardware, it's going to publish on this named topic. Consumers don't actually have to be in the same process or even on the same CPU, but they do have to be on a similar network or at least discoverable through a, any kind of DDS routing technology. We'll talk about what that means in other videos. Every time it wants to inform the system, the ROS node will synthesize a message that other ROS nodes will consume. For example, the nav stack. 
The nav stack by default will listen to IMU raw, but you can tell it uh, if you have multiple IMUs which IMU to listen to. As the ROS node generates messages, it will stick them into this name topic and it will queue up and eventually be pushed out to anybody who's listening, including the nav stack. And this will happen at some rate, which itself can be defined in the property system. Now I can start up a visualizer at any time and say, okay, I want to start listening to IMU messages. For example, we'll talk about Arviz later that can subscribe to IMU messages, and it can do it at a different rate. So now I want to talk about some ROS2 tools. First is the build tool, Qualcomm. The second is ROS2.exe, which is a command line tool for interacting with the ROS2 environment. RViz2, which is a visualizer, and RQT, which I use a lot for message tracing, but it does so much more. So when you're working with a ROS composition, often you need to build your own sources, not just configuration. This can include things like the launch file and your binary and scripts. The typical workspace involves a root workspace. And if you're familiar with something like Visual Studio, this is like the solution file, which aggregates together many projects so that the projects build in the correct order. This is how the Qualcomm workspace is set up. Qualcomm expects you to run it within your root workspace, or what I called my robot workspace here. And it must have an SRC directory that contains ROS packages. A package in ROS can contain multiple ROS nodes, but is a, a commonly built together. Your ROS node has a entry in the source directory, and underneath of it has all of its files. You can have other ROS nodes peered to yours in the same workspace, and when you build them together, they are all composed together and run from the same environment. If you use Visual Studio Code, you'll actually launch the Vis Visual Studio Code on the robot workspace, and then using the Visual Studio Code ROS extension, you can use the build tools directly in Visual Studio Code and not have to worry about interacting with Qualcomm directly. ROS2 provides a command line interface uh, called ROS2. It has uh, many, many features. But the four that you'll most likely encounter are run, which means I want to run a specific executable within a package. I want to launch a specific launch file within a package. Or I want to interact with topics. For example, I just want to see a stream of messages come from a specific topic. Or I want to generate some. And it's, this one's kind of cool because you can pass YAML as the descriptor for the message, and it'll synthesize a message from that YAML descriptor. I now want to talk about two other visual tools, RViz2 and RQT. RViz2 is actually where I spend a lot of time. It allows you to visualize what's going on in your robot. So let's go look at, take a look at that. So this is RViz2. You'll see that there are three main panes. One pane over here is um, how you customize the view. Most of the time I spend in the 3D view, although you might find yourself in the top-down view if you're working a lot with two-dimensional robots. I often just close that out. This left pane is where you customize your visualizations. The title bar has a couple of things that you'll find that you use uh, for navigation. 2D pose estimate allows you to say where the robot is so it can self-localize. Then you can provide a 2D goal pose and have it move through your environment. RViz is actually publishing topics right now, so we can see those when we go to the Add button. If you want to install a visualizer and then attach it to an IMU, you can use or to a message, you can use this pane or you can select the by topic. And this will show you uh, published topics and the visualizers that are appropriate for the message. For example, RViz is publishing on goal pose and initial pose. 
So you can select the message or the visualizer for that topic. Now, if you go ahead and select 2D pose, you can set a pose and it'll show you the visualization of that pose because of this visualizer. We'll be adding things like IMU, maps, and things in future videos. Now let's switch over to RQT. So when you launch RQT, there's not much going on here. You have to add a plugin. So go to the plugins folder or the plugins menu. Um, my screen capture is not capturing that, but I'm going to the topics menu and then selecting topic monitor. And what this will do is it'll actually share with you all of the messages that are current or all of the topics that are currently being published. Although it won't show you the messages unless you select the checkbox. So let's make it a little more interesting. I'm going to switch over to a terminal and I'm going to launch a joystick. Okay, so now I'm in a terminal and I'm, I happen to know that there is a joystick package installed. And I know that within that package, there is launch file that configures the joystick to connect to a Xbox controller. So I'm going to type ROS2 launch joystick package and it's named joy launch .python. Yes, launch files are actually Python scripts. So what will happen is this ROS node is located, launched, and configured to connect to an Xbox controller. So I have an Xbox controller here. Now I have available a configuration for the iPega controller that allows you to use a, say, a Surface Go as your robot controller. So now let's switch over to RQT. Within RQT, we can see that there is now a joystick message and feedback. Feedback allows you to rumble the joystick, whereas the joy uh, topic will allow the or will allow you to consume events from the joystick. Now there are two different um, fields on that message. One is for the digital buttons that are either on or off, and the analog buttons, which give you a value from negative one to positive one. Those triggers are also analog. So you can see if I press it, you'll get a value between negative one and positive one. You can in interpret the joystick however you want. For example, if you wanted to nod a head or lift a, an arm or something like that, you can create a ROS node which will consume this joystick output and turn it into action. Fortunately, there's already a ROS node that takes a joystick command and turns it into command velocity, which allows you to drive the joystick or drive your robot around by generating command velocities, which are a standard message for driving robots. I hope this was useful. Look forward to you in future videos.